All right. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited to be able to bring you this topic today on parenting an intense child and how to make it better. You know, this is a topic that over the last 20 years, as I have specialized in families that are raising kids with big feelings, big emotions, sometimes even big diagnoses, this topic of what can we do for tools to make it more peaceful and easier so that we feel equipped is a super noble topic, of course, because we want to help kids, we want to help ourselves. But what I want to get grounded in as we're kicking off here today is that having a four-year-old at home myself right now, I know that it can be really helpful to consider things like, where are we having fun with our kids? Where are we not having fun with our kids? Um, when are we laughing and when are we not laughing? Where do we feel confident in life? Where do we not feel confident? So even though this is a parenting webinar, I'm a firm believer that how we parent is often an indicator of how we tend to relate in relationships and across areas of our life. So as we dive into some practical tools to make parenting easier, to flow, if you are if you have any type A quality like myself and you like to have a plan, you're definitely going to get that today. But I'm also wanting to give you some food for thought, some things to chew over, because I often hear things like, Samantha, um, how do I make it better at home? I'm suddenly an angry parent a dad had told me once, I'm an angry dad, but I had never been an angry guy before I had kids. And I think that, of course, parenting brings up so many things for each of us. But the other truth is that for a lot of people, we have been parenting a shorter time than we've been in other significant roles in our life, right? You probably, probably, maybe, possibly, you've been in a career for longer than you've been a parent. So those feelings, like this dad was talking about, the rage that boiled up, him feeling ticked off and feeling angry, it's not that he didn't feel it at work, it's just that he had more practice learning what to do with those feelings. And of course, in a public setting, he had more practice with masking his feelings. So while we're talking about what we can do to create more peace at home today, you're also really, I'll say this for the last time, you're also gonna be really considering who are you as a person and how is some of how you relate as a person showing up in your parenting? And then when we get really precise about parenting, we can consider, so how is your child showing up as a person and what does that mean about them? What does that mean about their personality, their nervous system? Um, is there something about the diagnosis that you're going to learn about that your child may or may not have? So buckle up. I'm really excited to dive into this with you today. And for those of you who have your videos on, thank you. It's so nice to know I'm talking to real people and see some smiles and some like monotasking right here in the room with me. So if you want to turn your videos on, feel free. We've got the next hour to spend here together. And in the chat box with your direct message, no worries. I know your camera's not working, so um, no problem at all. So let's dive in right away, all right? So I want you to come back with me to 2004. That's when I got my master's degree in communication disorders. And when I graduated from the University of Minnesota, my first challenging come to self moment was Charlie. Charlie was eight years old and it was my job to transition him out of his third grade classroom into the speech therapy office so that we could work on really noble skills like making friends and having conversation and looking people in the eyes and basically like having conversations about things rather than acting things out. So when on this particular day, a few months after graduating, I was transitioning Charlie using all my skills of persuasion to bring him down this long hallway. We're like 15 steps away from my speech therapy office. My hope is building, it's gonna work this time. I'm bright eyed, bushy tailed, 22 years old. And as we're getting closer, I start feeling a little nervous. We're 14 steps away, 13, 12, 11, 10 steps away. And what happens is the same thing that happens twice a week ever since I accepted this job in Southern California, which was the meltdown. Charlie dropped to the floor, kicking and screaming those things. You never want to hear a child scream at you in public, especially when like you might not have self-confidence in uh, how you relate to children quite yet, especially if they have a diagnosis or a background that you're not as familiar with. All the kids in this school, um, it was an autism school, so all these kids had uh, an ASD diagnosis. 
And what I remember when I looked down at him at first was I felt this like clenching inside me. I was like, oh, what am I going to do here? And then immediately, because I was in a public setting, I remember looking over my shoulders and noticing the teachers peering through the classroom windows, looking outside of the cafeteria where they had been working with students or helping to serve them lunch. And I remember looking down at Charlie and feeling the sweat roll down my back and like the truth moment hit me. I have no idea what to do here. So uh, raise your hand or put up a little icon or type in the chat box if you've ever had that situation, right? And, you know, now that I'm 42 years old, I'm no longer embarrassed to say that in that moment, I was so stuck. I was so stuck in my thinking of, well, should I go get that really cool tool that the social worker was showing me that breathing ball to teach Charlie to take deep breaths? Or wait, wait, maybe am I supposed to sit down next to him and be extra gentle right now? Is that what would help him get through this hard moment? Oh, no, no, I have it. I have it. Um, I remember my parents talked so much raising us five kids about boundaries. Maybe I'm supposed to be firmer and lay down the law and then Charlie will respect me. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. How does that work? Real good, right? <laughs> so that day I ended up just bribing Charlie and I just brought him back to his classroom. He transitioned beautifully. There wasn't an interruption. Don't worry. The teacher and the other students were all fine. But I had to make that walk of shame back down the hallway to my office. I closed the door, put my head in my hands with the light off. And I thought maybe I chose the wrong job. Now, some of you are here today because you're parents and you're kind of wondering that sometimes like, uh, did I really know what I was signing up for? Is this the thing that I want to do forever? And some of you are here because you're professionals. Some of you I see have even been through my parent coaching certification program. I've worked with over 75 professionals in the last seven years to teach tools to create more peace at home that are brain-based and rooted in attachment, work really well for kids with really intense behaviors. And you're here because you're raising kids like this yourself, or you're doing a really good job in your professional role. And then you come home and you're like, I'm losing it. I don't know how to balance both of these things. So what I wanna promise you is that this tender space that all of us are in here today is designed to be the space where we say, I don't really know what to do right here. It doesn't mean you're dumb. It doesn't mean you haven't studied it. It doesn't mean you don't care, but it does mean that there's a reason why you're getting stuck. And what I hear most often at the end of this workshop is that there are some dots that are gonna be connected for you so that you, of all 300 of you who registered for this webinar today, there's something that you can do that will make a difference towards making things smoother or easier in your, in your personal life or your professional life. So. Let's talk about what some of those things are. In order to, um, well, actually I should probably give you some more context. Um, so yes, master's degree in communication disorder. After seven years of working in the field, I left and became certified as a parenting coach. I had created a curriculum over my time of working with students age three to 22 that was rooted in brain science and answered the question that I always had with Charlie, which is what am I missing? or the voice that was in my head that was my mom speaking to me, um, even though she wasn't in the room with me saying, Samantha, every child has gifts. You can learn to draw them out. So think about this for a second, right? Uh, I see in the chat box, welcome to every day of your life since your 10 year old son was born, right? Every child has gifts. You can learn to draw them out. But what can become really tricky is that there are some smatterings of information that are really important for you to know from the play therapy role, the play therapy world, excuse me, and from the sensory processing or occupational therapy world, as well as the really standard traditional brain science and child development world, which was really pioneered by Dr. Daniel Siegel out of UCLA, who has authored the whole brain child and a bunch of other books. And like the trauma world, Dr. Bruce Perry talks about these things and how do we navigate situations with kids when there's big feelings and big emotions is ultimately what I'm going to boil that down to. So when we're looking at what's beneath kids' behavior today, I want to answer that question of where are they getting stuck? Well, we always know the reason why, not necessarily. But when we understand where they're getting stuck and what our reaction to that tends to be, 
it will help us move the needle to make a difference so that they're stuck less and we know what impact the, our reaction is having on a child. That can be for better or for worse. So you might find some impacts that are really positive. Yay, that's part of the goal of today. But you're also going to see some things where you unintentionally are impacting your child and maybe like um, shooting yourself in the foot, having an influence that's creating more stuck feelings. So um, let me grab out my screen share here to show you exactly what I'm talking about to answer the question, why are kids acting this way? All right. Oh, yeah. And so we're pulling this information from the, the curriculum that I get hired to teach nationally, um, including Minnesota Association for Children's Mental Health and Frazier. And while we're not covering all eight of these today, I'm going to cover a few things that will make a really big difference in getting you started. All right. So what are they saying in the brain science world as far as why are kids having these big reactions and meltdowns? And I'm not talking about things like a diagnosis or there's more toxicity these days, or you have a child who's the canary in the coal mine and they're sensitive to EMFs, which are those electromagnetic frequencies from Bluetooth. Like I'm raising my hand because I'm one of those uh, canaries in the coal mine. While all of those things have certain lenses, I want to really look at this from a parenting and child development lens, okay? So we know from Dr. Daniel Siegel that the brain can be conceptualized into two parts at the beginning here. We can talk about the upstairs brain and the downstairs brain. Now, some of you know a bit about this already, so I want to pull you right off the bat in the chat box. What do you know about this downstairs brain, otherwise known as fight, flight, or freeze? What have you heard about it? What have you studied? What has your therapist told you? That's an off a common place we hear about it. Survival mode. Yes, you've got it. Mm -hmm. So this is the mechanism that when we're early on in the fetus and our brain's being developed, um, it is it turns on your fight flight system so that if a bear was chasing you in the woods, this is my very classic Minnesota example. If a black bear was chasing me, I'm going to have some fight, which might mean like fight it. I'm going to have a tendency to go into flight mode, which is run away. Or I'm going to go into freeze mode and I'm going to lay down and I'm going to play dead. So it's early develop, early developing. It's meant to keep us safe. Some people call it lizard brain. Hey, Kelsey, nice to see you here. You know it, OTs. It turns off your higher level social capacities. So the things that I learned from OTs early on was that if this is activated. If downstairs is activated, these social skills that I was trained to work um, to help to develop uh, are not accessible. So if it's activated, you can't access this. You, reptilian, primordial, survival before executive functioning. Yeah. So let me come back to executive functioning in a second if I can remember. Primitive reflexes. Aha. I see you over there, Clarabelle. You got it. So this downstairs brain, when it's activated, it means that adrenaline and cortisol is flooding the system and a child is reacting as if you were the bear chasing them through the woods. And all you asked them to do was to please tie your shoes so we can get out the door on time and get to school. But your kid, if they have externalized behavior, you're gonna see more fight mode, screaming, you might call it stubbornness, defiance, manipulation. If you have a kid who internalizes more or has a pleaser personality, personality like I tended to have growing up. You might see more flight mode, which is like curling inside themselves, feeling like, oh, I'm just a bad kid or not like kind of stuck, not really able to move forward. Sometimes we call this rigid um, or things have to be a certain way and they're controlling, but this could also be evidence of overwhelm, anxiety, freeze mode. And this becomes a real challenge when we're raising kids who have more of this fight, flight or freeze activation because What's happening on a neurological level is adrenaline and cortisol are, are ruling the system in that moment. And so when that happens, I call it fire in the brain. I call it fire in the brain because if I call it fight or flight, I don't really know what to do. But if I call it fire in the brain, being the outdoor camping person that I am, I think, oh, got it. Before I go to bed at night, I need to put out the fire. I need to pour water on the bonfire. The same thing is true when kids are having really intense behaviors, feelings, and reactions. Our 
invitation is to figure out how do we put out the fire? Now, obviously you've thought about this before. You're like, how do I get this to stop? How do we make this better? This just needs to go away. You know, like we're always thinking something like that when kids are having this type of a moment. But what I want to alert you to is that the other thing that we're trying to move children towards, and this gets in the way of fire, is we're trying to move them towards upstairs brain skills. So we're trying to move them into things like solve this problem, pay attention, engage, manage your behavior, have self-regulation. But when there's fire in the brain and I use one of these skills, I'm going to tell you a real scenario here and you're going to hear yourself in it in some way. I, I think so. Um, if I'm trying to use these upstairs brain skills, they don't work because they sound like this. <clears throat> Charlie, Charlie, uh, what could you do right now instead of screaming, I hate you? No. Not going to work in the moment. This kid's not going to be able to communicate with me. Charlie, check my eyes. Check my eyes. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Right? So we see these kids where um, my kid's only four. So it's not that long ago that as a two-year-old, I'd be like, grab him by the chin. Mason, mommy's talking to you. Or this was common in the autism world 20 years ago. I don't know if it is anymore. But when we're trying to engage kids in this upstairs brain mode and they're distracted or they have big feelings, us engaging their attention doesn't actually calm fire in the brain. In fact, what you're asking them to do is tap into upstairs brain, otherwise known as executive functioning, to get themselves organized and on task, and they cannot access it in the moment. The other thing that I would do early on is I got one of those beautiful preschool color breathing balls where if you draw them apart, they expand. And if you use it well with a the kid, then they learn, oh, when I take a breath, my belly expands and it's a visual. And then when I exhale, whew, then it collapses. And so if a kid's feeling really anxious or stressed out, they may be like, I'm breathing like this with that ball. So if I try to use that in the moment to show Charlie how to deepen his breath as a person who wasn't skilled in that mindfulness tool yet, uh, because uh, rule of thumb is don't introduce that in the moment. If you do it proactively over time, when there's not those moments, that's how kids learn them best. But what would Charlie do with that breathing ball? He would grab it. He would smush it. He would throw it, uh, likely at me, given this situation. So you want to understand about fire in the brain because it begins to give us clues around what are the things that we're doing that actually and unintentionally contribute to more fire. And we're gonna move into that after a bit here. But you wanna know too, that there are some kids who I call intense brain kids that are more prone to fire in the brain. And again, there can be lots of reasons for this, but ultimately what the symptoms look like or the signals look like is that they try to rule the roost. Their behaviors appear controlling or demanding. You feel like you're walking on eggshells and how the day unfolds revolves around them. Um, you also notice that the triggers for that fire can be confusing where you're like, how did this set you off today? Is it the smell coming out of the cafeteria? Is it time of day? Uh, maybe your child has some sensory processing challenges and the tag on the back of the shirt bothers them, or they're a neurotypical three-year-old and the seam isn't lined up on the, on the toe of the sock just right. Or maybe you have a 12-year-old who usually eats oatmeal for breakfast and heaven forbid you ate the last banana and suddenly today they come down the stairs and they want the banana. So you're like, what sets you off? I'm trying to stay three steps ahead of you and I can't. I'm constantly putting out fires. So if that's happening where you're feeling confused about what's causing or leading to these outbursts, this child might have intense brain wiring. And the reactions are atypical. And not to make a judgment statement there, but atypical meaning it's intense. Given the low significance of the situation, you might be like a mom of a seven-year-old who um, had to the child like required that the socks came on and off five times every morning to get them lined up just right. Like that doesn't seem like a really typical reaction. It takes a long time. It's really frustrating. We're like, what's going on? Is it my parenting strategy? Is it my kid? And so the reaction is really intense for the situ for what you would expect in the situation. But here is the kicker. The kicker is when you have a child with more intense emotional or behavior reactivity, if you match them with fire, you know what your kid's going to do, right? Mm, 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 mm. Am I off the screen yet? <laughs> like 
they're going to escalate and things are going to get worse. So you can't fall into a default style for some, uh, some, you know, some of us are raised in a culture or a nation or a family community that has leaned heavily on um, authoritarian parenting. An authoritarian style is one where it's kind of stereotypically the parent says, I am the parent, you will obey me, and they are not flexible to their kids' needs. Well, that's a real problem if your child has sensory needs and they can't put their socks on and you force them to wear their socks. Because do you know what they what now all their brain power is going to when they're trying to manage their own behavior at school? They're trying not to flip out over these socks that are really actually bothering them and causing them um, distress. Of course, they can't sit in their seat. Of course, they're tapping the pencil. Of course, they're talking back to the teacher. Of course, they're picky eating and nothing's going to satisfy them that day. It's like if I'm wearing, <laughs> this is kind of a random example that popped in my head. Like if I'm wearing too tight pants, I'm not like really happy and soft and relaxed all day. I'm looking for the time where I can get at home and put on some softer pants, right? Uh, okay, that was random. So you want to know if your child has more of this fight or flight stress response and this intense brain wiring because it's going to influence how you're reacting to them. If you know that they have more of that downstairs brain activation, it might create some space for a little bit more compassion or a different tool for you to use in that moment. Because one of the tools that we don't wanna use, if I can get this to move here, is we don't wanna just slip into this thinking that my child is only trying to control me, de be defiant and manipulate me. Instead, what I want you to understand is in the brain science world, they literally talk about the little scientist in the brain. Like that's a part of child development. You'll remember this if your kid was uh, from when your kid was a toddler and they started saying no, or when they were three years old, it depends on your kid's age exactly. But um, there were natural stages of development where they got more resistant and they wanted to say no. And even if they wanted the thing that you were offering, they would still be resistant to you. And that's because there's this quality in natural child development that says the child's brain is constantly going to be testing and testing to see if I can win. Not unlike a scientist testing a hypothesis, wondering like what's going to make this work this time. Instead, though, what your child is trying to win isn't the thing that you're thinking. It's not the cookie. It's not a later bedtime. It's not more screen time. It's not skipping or avoiding school like it looks like they're trying to avoid. The intense brain child is looking for an energy match. They're looking to achieve that baseline of adrenaline and cortisol. They're looking for you to spike it with them because it creates a sense of homeostasis. If a child has more intense brain wiring and you're like, man, this kid is constantly stirring up drama. They just seem to like the chaos around them. They spin our whole house into the state, it's because that energy match is really compelling. And if they can win that, it creates this sense in the brain of familiar, right? So it's like, if you are somebody who tends towards overworking, busy, 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 doing all the time, it's hard for you to relax, you might be more prone to something like adrenaline addiction. Yep. And I'm not talking about like motorcycles and skydiving and things like that, but keeping your schedule busy. If you have something that you have to rush towards, you get a hit of adrenaline. And what adrenaline does to grownups is it keeps us alert. It keeps us awake. It's not putting us in fight mode because we need to like get through a day and not cause disruption with, with coworkers or other significant adults around us. But it keeps us energized. And it's kind of like if you take a shot of espresso in the morning shoop, and you're like energized for the day. When it starts wearing off a few hours later, you might go for it again. Wears off a few hours later, you might go for your dark chocolate. Wears off a few hours later, now it's nighttime, you haven't done anything fun for the day, you start eating snack food because you're trying to get these, we try to get these hits of things that energize us. So when kids are testing to see if they can win this time, they're looking for that matching fire with fire to create a sense of familiarity. Now that can seem really strange to people. Like, well, why would uh, my child want me to yell at them? So if you're a parent who thinks my child only listens when I yell, I have to get sterner and mean in order for them to listen to me. So if you've thought that before and you've wondered, well, why is that? It's kind of like 
um, if I were walking in the woods here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and there was a grassy path, but I walked it every single day. And there was a, a path across from my home that was like this. And everybody would come to this park and they would walk along and doing this winter medallion hunt. And pretty soon the grass on the path would fade away and it would be dirt. Because the more people who walk on this path, the deeper this pathway becomes into the ground. The same thing is true when it comes to this um, fire in the brain response with children, the more they experience fire in the brain and the people around them match fire with fire, this neural pathway deepens of this is familiar, this is how we do things around here. What we want to do is we want to not just like close down that path, but we want to begin learning how do we walk a new path that doesn't have so much fight or flight. And here's how, here's a place where I'm hoping it can give you a little bit of hope here. Um, so there's another quality in our brain, another part of our brain called mirror neurons. Now mirror neurons reflect the state that another person is in. Good news and bad news. If we want our child to keep walking down this path of dysregulation, if we match fire with fire, then the mirror neurons in their brain are going to kick in and say, aha, this is what we do when we're ticked off. This is what we do when we have big feelings and they see big bodies and they hear loud voices and they see rushing pace. They might see aggressive holds, things like that. Um, there might be threatening, there might be closing doors and locking them. And so we start thinking about, well, what is, what am I mirroring to my child? Now, this feels like a really obvious example when a child is young before preschool. I think about um, going to Thanksgiving dinner when my child was 16 months old and he'd be walking around the house uh, leading up to this and he'd just we'd be like hey Mason where's your socks and he'd be like I don't know I don't know and it'd be really dramatic like that well we go to Thanksgiving dinner and there's this extra like turkey leftovers and we're like where are we going to put this and I go out into the garage where the extra where I'm thinking of, I'm going to put them on this counter because it's plenty cold outside and my mother-in-law comes in and she's like uh, Samantha is there room in the fridge where do you think we're going to put this I'm literally holding this big leftover turkey and a platter. I'm like, I don't know where we're going to put it. And she goes there. That's where your kid got it from. So we think about that in playful situations, situations that we're proud of or delighted by with children. And when they're older, we also want to keep considering that some of the things we're mirroring to children about what to do with their anger and their anxiety are things that we might not be modeling well. We might be mirroring to them that we talk nasty um, or some of the other things that I already said. The good side of this is that because of mirror neurons, the, uh, the other th thing can be true, where when you truly learn not just head knowledge, but it gets into your body, your somatics, your heart space, like what do I need to do to not match fire with fire? You begin modeling for your child what to do with those big feelings. And guess what? A lot of us struggle with this because we were raised by authoritarian, stressed out for various reasons, parents. And so when you're learning to mirror your child what to do with these big feelings, it's not just talk, 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 talk through it and try to come up with a solution because that's upstairs, friends. Talk, talk, talking your way to solutions is not mirroring self-regulation. So we're going to get to that. Uh, that's the third tip I'm going to be sharing here today. This We're still on the first. Let me let you off the hook because sometimes I speak really directly and we're like, Eek! okay, there's a camera in my house. Samantha sees what's going on. <laughs> I only see what's going on because I've worked with over a thousand families, okay? Like across cultures and like so many different identities and situations. The other thing about mirror neurons that becomes really important is that when Charlie is melting down at my feet, my mirror neurons are triggered too. Right. So if he has rage, if he's melting down because he's ticked off be for whatever reason, doesn't even matter. I'm now going to have that triggered inside of me. In fact, working with Charlie gave me an understanding of what my dad meant. I was only 22 years old, but it made me understand like, oh, that's why my dad would be like, my blood is boiling at you children. Like, oh, got it. That was rage. So when I'm sitting, standing here, and my blood is boiling, it's not just because I'm ticked off and feeling powerless. 
It's because he's expressing rage and I'm feeling rage. Okay, so it's not all our own fault as parents. <laughs> That's good news, right? Like we don't have to be perfect. We're getting rage triggers too. I don't know about you, but as a type A people pleasing Enneagram to helper person, it's much easier for me to be compassionate and breathe through the moments when children are sad rather than when they're raging. I can do the rocking and the cooing and the talking gently to them until they reset, but it's the raging that can really trigger me. So I want you to consider when we're talking about this fire in the brain, not just what's happening in terms of your child's fire, but in your family, what does fire look like? And if you're willing, type it in the chat box. Don't say like, my spouse's fire looks like this, but type a word, what does fire look like? Is it yelling? Is it banishing kids outside? Do you have more freezer spots where you just start sweating? And you're like, I don't know what to do here. Hulk smash, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Conflict, big emotions, yeah. Swearing, frustration, crying. Yeah, uh, um, negative language, self-talk, I'm such an idiot. Yeah, so I want you to know what fire looks like because this isn't just a class on parenting an intense child, how to make it better, fix your kid. I mean, I, it's not. Like there's places where the wheels fall off and we need, need tools for working with kids. And what are the tools for us as parents? Because your kid probably has some good resources, a school social worker, some sort of mindfulness app. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how effective, you know, I'm just rattling things off. But um, knowing what your fire looks like has a strong impact on your kids. So you might be, um, there was a, a, what's the name for a, an MD, a, a, a doctor, <laughs> He's a geriatric doctor, that's what he was. So young guy, but geriatric doctor. And he's like, I'm really schooled and I'm not sure what to do if I should get my child in the regular medical system for help with mental health concerns because we can't get our 12-year-old out of the house. He's become really violent. Now, this was um, during early days of COVID and obviously there were a lot of other stresses happening and this was really escalating for them. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, I'm wondering if I should take him to a play therapist or like some sort of mental health profession. I said, okay, well, you said you can't get your kid out of the house to like go to piano lessons that he used to love, right? Right. Okay, so do you think he'd go see a therapist? No, absolutely not. Okay, well, and I'm always asking questions like, well, what does your child do that makes you so concerned? Well, we hit this breaking point where he threw a suitcase over the banister the other day when my wife was walking underneath it, he was intentionally trying to hurt her. And I said, okay, well, what are some of the feelings that your kid's experiencing right now? And where this conversation went is he said, well, he's just always been controlling. He wants to hurt people. He's aggressive, he's hostile. And what we started tapping into was, and how does your ability to notice those emotions, like how well are you able to notice those emotions out loud to say things like, I see you're really upset. I'm noticing how mad you are. You seem really overwhelmed. And he's like, I, I don't talk like that. I have to keep everybody safe. So I'm saying like, you can't do this. It doesn't keep somebody safe. I'm going to have to call the police. I said, so when you're perceiving your child's behavior as hostile and aggressive, that's going to cause you to parent a certain way. Versus when you notice this is fire in the brain and your child's showing fight response, some of what you're noticing with your language is you're fighting back because you're protecting the other people. You're fighting with him and you're saying you can't do this and now that's escalating and this is what's happening just like that intense brain child photo. And he said, so are you telling me, and this is a spoiler alert because I'm getting to this is still in today's talk with a, a graphic. He's like, but are you saying that I just need to like say my kids emotions out loud? I said, that's part of it. Your child is acting things out because all behavior is communication with children. So what is your child communicating? Well, from my lens as a brain-based and rooted curriculum creator one, and parent coach, like what I'm noticing is there's fire in the brain and he keeps turning up the volume because you're not seeing and hearing how much distress he's under. And he's like, oh. 
So if I practice calm and this emotional validation strategy that you're talking about, should I also put my kid in therapy? And I said, talk to me at the end of this four months and you, I'm going to ask you that question back. So fast forward to four months later and I said, hey, do you remember you asked me that question? What do you think? And he said, we don't have these scary situations anymore. We have yelling. He has big feelings, but I feel like I'm the person who's able to talk him through things now. And I'm the person who he needs to talk it through with because here I was calling him aggressive and disrespectful and defiant, but he was perceiving me as being that way too, because he didn't feel like I was listening to him. So what happens when there are these really big feelings in the household and because of mirror neurons like I described is that there's fire bouncing off of everywhere and and I wanted to say something about this real quickly so let me pause and see if it comes in oh I was just going to say given everything you typed in the chat box so notice what does your fire look like are you fight do you tend towards flight run away disconnect I got to get out of here. I'm taking a break. Does it look like freeze? You don't know what to do. You sit there, you get hit or hurt. You feel powerless, but you stay in the room. Thank you. Yeah, I know that depends on the situation and, and you don't have to answer this really directly, but know that this is going to be part of, of making things better at home is beginning to regulate what's, oh, I just paused, regulate, self-regulate. So noticing where your fight, flight, or freeze is kicking up and then we're going to layer in some tools designed for you as a parent to calm their fire and to soothe your own. All right, so I want to give you an example of, I'm going to trigger fire in the brain for you. All right, so um, if you have a kid in the room, <laughs> turn the volume down a little bit. I'm not going to scare you, but if you feel willing, I'm a trauma-informed professional. So um, if you want to keep your eyes open, you may. If you feel uh, open to closing your eyes or gazing downwards, I invite you to do that because I want you to feel what's happening in your body as you hear this trigger word, okay? So if you're ready, close your eyes. It's only 20 seconds. No. Knock it off. Stop that. Oh, I said don't do that. Why do you always, don't, I said no. Open your eyes. We just had new people join the call. Sorry, you just caught a fire starter. Starting phrases with no. So type in the chat box, what did you notice in your body when you were listening to that? Surprise. Yeah, it can be startling. Like this lady looks really nice, but she's yelling no at me. <laughs> Shut down, okay. You might have more freeze response, Lori. Panic, tension, anger, tightness, irritability, chills, increased heart rate, warm and alert from Jay. Yeah, alert, right? You're like, alert, I'm on, I'm on. Is there a bear chasing me? What's going on? You flinch, there's adrenaline. When a neurophysiology, like a stress response is kicked up, you'll, like on the basic, on the body level, you're gonna feel increased heart rate. That feeling of blood rushing, you might feel tightness in the chest, shallow breathing. Some people feel cloudy heads or really like alert and open thinking uh, because adrenaline pushes everything out and can help you do things like focus or figure out how to stay safe. And um, there's common reactions to starting phrases with no. Like the four common reactions, I think I put this in a slide. I'm gonna share it if I did for our visual learning friends. I didn't, so let me just tell you, is that when you start phrases with no, um, is it can create it can create resistance. It triggers resistance, or I would even call it retaliation. Another response is that it can trigger a withdrawal effect, or you tune me out. We think about this with teenagers sometimes, where they're like, "Why aren't you listening to me?" I've seen this with with stressed out really little kids, preschoolers too, where they're coloring and you're like, "Come and eat," and they're like you tap them on the shoulder and they still don't listen to you. They've tuned you out to tune out some of the stressors in their home. So we've got that withdrawal response. We've got the fight response. Uh, we've got the whatever, I'm not listening to you. And then we've also got like an appeasing response, which could also be more like fawn, like fine, I'm going to listen, but I'm not happy about it and I'm going to retaliate later. But from a brain perspective, we know that it triggers more fire in the brain. Now you all had some sort of response even if it was um, like tuning me out because that was a really annoying exercise and you didn't do anything wrong. 
And you, I was going to say, as a grown up, you're probably not hearing no all day, unless you're working with kids. Okay. If you're a grown up around other grown ups, you're probably not hearing no from them all day long. So now we start thinking about, well, what happens to kids' brain wiring if they're impulsive, if they're high energy, if they're dysregulated, if they have a hard time having a, a safe body? Well, are they hearing no also from their teachers, from well-meaning professionals who don't really have behavior tools and know how to engage them? And that can deepen neural pathways too. So I want you to consider that starting phrases with no is a fire starter. Now I have a whole list of 11 fire starters and reasons emotionally intense kids act up. I'll share it with you at the end, but I'm going to keep plugging away through this for now. Okay. So what is our starting point? Well, I want you to have a really practical takeaway. And so in light of this and knowing that when I teach my curriculum, it's over eight weeks. So like, what is the starting point? What does everybody write on the feedback forums at the end of these eight weeks together? They say your call mantra when I actually did it was the beginning of change in our home. So the calm mantra is having a calm body, a calm voice, and a calm face. In this one hour together here today, are we like fixing, how do we do positive discipline? How do I create a morning routine? How do I get my kid into bed without arguing against me? No. But the starting point isn't any of those tools, even though like there's some really effective and straightforward tools. It's how do I begin calming the fire in the brain so that their mirror neurons begin getting the message to close down and create a grassy path over that well-worn path and instead go down something different. And so this includes things like it's body, voice, and face because I can't tell you how many times I ask the question. Uh, so when your kid didn't come and eat, turn off the game and come and eat, um, what did? How, tell me what happened. And the parent will say, well, I said, get in here right now. It's getting cold and your sister's waiting. Okay. And most of the time, you know, like our, our brains come out of our mouths, meaning like the tone and the facial affect and like the clenched fists by the side usually show up when a parent is recreating something that's feeling stressful for them. So remembering that because mirror neurons pick up on nonverbal information as well, like check your body, check your voice, check your face. Not unlike when my, uh, uh, husband started changing, di changing diapers for the first time for first time four years ago. And he's really analytical. He's a pediatric chiropractor and he's really thoughtful and uh, intelligent. And he'd be looking down at our baby on the table and be changing the diaper like this, like first this piece goes here and then this piece goes here. And our baby would start crying. He'd like go in nice and lovely and in a good mood. And then he'd start crying and I'd walk in the room and be like, honey, check your face just you're like this far away from our baby just check your face right now I was like, oh okay like let your face reflect the love in your heart <laughs> all right it doesn't solve the world's problems it doesn't even solve our family problems because it's not just about having the love in our hearts it's also about having some tools at our disposal and i wish i could talk to you for eight hours and take you through my whole program but given that we have 15 minutes left i want to say one more thing okay and share one more tool with you. So as a kind of side note about this fire starter behavior of starting words with no, there was a study that said when kids are toddlers, they hear the word no every nine minutes. And that actually makes sense as a toddler, right? They're climbing on something, there's the rolly chair in your home office and they're coming down here and you don't want them to fall or they're putting something in the light socket or they're walking too close to the edge and from across the room, you're like, no! But the difficulty in terms of now kids' personalities getting shaped and their adrenaline uh, ratcheting up and getting used to this baseline of stress is that we forget to fade the stern directives. So keeping that in mind for our, our high energy, low impulse control kids, if you want something that you can do differently, okay? All right. So we've got this concept of calming the fire. We've got this concept of avoiding fire starters. And then lastly, I want to talk about one more thing that Dr. Daniel Siegel brilliantly coined. So he talks about the right brain and the left brain, which I touched on earlier. So the right brain is responsible for emotions and the left brain is responsible for logic and language. So when kids are having big reactions, the other place they're stuck is they're stuck emotionally. So it's not just that there's adrenaline and cortisol, it's that their emotions, they don't know what to do. 
And kids from the age of zero to three exclusively experience the world emotionally. And so after the age of three, there's some more neurons and pathways um, being developed. You're seeing more logic and language. It doesn't mean they have none under the age of three. It just goes to show that even preschoolers who might be able to have precocious conversations with you when they're having big reactions, they're very early in being able to do something about their feelings, to manage them on their own. Not unlike myself at 42, if I'm overwhelmed and planning a birthday party and traveling to do a keynote for work and didn't, you know, the nanny is sick or something like that. If I'm really stuck, I can't think logically through a situation. I have to figure out how to reset. And do you know how old we are when our, uh, what, what science says, what the studies say when our brains are fully developed and integrated? Type that in the chat box if you'd like. You got it, Lisa. Yep. Mm, yeah, it's mid twenties and higher. They're even saying like 30. Sometimes I've had parents say like, oh, isn't it once they get double digits, like 10 years old? And no, no. It's when they're um, like late 20s and 30. So we're thinking about, well, why does my why does my nine-year-old have such big reactions? We talk about it all the time, why they can't do that and what the consequences are going to be. And I don't want them to have to go to, I don't want them to like end up in jail. And I'm like, okay, hang on, hang on. All right. So where they're stuck is emotionally. And if you respond with logic and language, the brain says, you don't see me, you don't hear me. So what do we get to do as the grown up? Well, we're invited to stop over teaching them and recognize and validate their feeling. Right? So if I'm ticked off and I'm ranting about something and I'm talking to my husband, Ty, and like, uh, explaining everything that's going on. And if he says something to me, well, why don't you just do this, honey? You told me this is what you want. I'm like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> Versus our, our keyword, I was, yeah, like our keyword is worried. When I'm mad, I'm actually worried. If I'm sad, I'm actually worried. If I'm afraid, I'm actually, so if any of you know me in public, if I'm having a problem with something, just notice that out loud that I'm worried. And what will happen, like with my husband who says, I can tell you're worrying about this. I will usually break into tears and I will say, I am worried and here's what I'm worried about. And it's related to this and it's related to the bad dream I had last night. And then I thought something was going to happen and nothing actually really happened. And then it's about money. And by the way, I didn't exercise, you know, like I'm going to talk about things for 10 minutes until I have released the pressure. I have opened when somebody acknowledges emotions and they're in a calm and caring space, then the pressure valve opens up and people will dump their emotions. So when you acknowledge your kids' emotions, parents are like, it makes it worse. Yes, it does. When your girlfriend says to you, um, I can see that you're really upset about this thing you're talking about in your significant partnership, what do you do? You rant longer. You tell them what's really upsetting about it for you. And then if they've held that calm, calm and safe space without trying to fix it, what does your body do? <sighs> it softens and you have relief. Well, guess what? There's brain science. It says when you connect a kids to their emotions, when you connect a child to their emotions, it connects them to you. When you connect a child to their emotions, it connects them to you. Is this true for all humans? I think so. Does our emotional capacity and interest in social emotional connectedness vary? Totally. Yeah, of course it does. But what this means, and this is like the cutting edge information from brain science and child development, is it means that if you want, if you're noticing the wheels are falling off in parenting, these are the things you can check. Am I calm? Am I avoiding fire starters? Am I connecting my kid to their emotions or am I, am I losing it at number one? I'm so mad because it sounds so disrespectful when they're calling me names and therefore like I can't even have the space to acknowledge their emotions because they're so disrespectful and we just need to fix it. The trouble with this, let's see if I can go back really quickly, is that if you're if you can't get over your offense about your child treating you that way without and you and you avoid recognizing some of these things that I'm sharing today, what you're going to be steered towards is you're going to be steered towards these ups, upstairs skills, which I put in gray 
you're going to be figuring out, okay, we're going to need better positive discipline. We need to talk about repair and conflict resolution because we're fighting all the time. We need a better daily routine so that the wheels don't keep falling off at this time of day. Red light parenting is about boundaries. I can talk about that in a different class. Instead, my invitation is there's a lot of people who talk about really good tools like this, but guess what? If you start with downstairs brain skills of calm and avoiding the fire starters, you're you're giving your child an opportunity to have less fire in their brain. And now we add in midbrain skills and we're taking this downstairs up approach. And, and what Dr. Daniel Siegel says is that then you create the staircase in the brain in the right order. And now they can access these skills. Now your positive discipline works. Now your bedtime routine works without fighting. Now your child listens without fighting you back. But there are some steps before that that make this uh, really possible. And so that's basically the work that I do in the world. All right, so let's take a look here. So what you've seen today is that where we tend to operate as parents, not the same place our kids are. So if you're looking for some ease and more peace at home, my invitation is to recognize where kids are at. Now, I'll share a tool with you in a second or I'll share that that free uh, 11 reasons kids act out fire starters in a second. But before I do, and I know some of you have just direct messaged me because you're like, okay, what can I do next? I want to take this further. I'm happy to talk about that. But I always journal before I do a presentation. And I want to tell you what I journaled on today because it's relevant to you as parents. Um, so I've been a keynote speaker since, I don't know, 2016, maybe I've traveled all around North America. And I wonder sometimes why is this information difficult to get through? What makes us have resistance to this information and not from a perspective of judgment or criticism at all. Like I'm a parent. I know how hard it is. I was also a kid who had blackout anxiety as a teenager and my parents never knew. They just thought I was sleeping on the linoleum floor in the kitchen in the morning, waiting for my toast to get ready. They didn't know I was literally blacking out because of built up stress inside. And so I was thinking, why do we have such a hard time changing our parenting approach? It's not just because we're trying to blame others or want people to fix our kids. Sometimes we're working really hard. We're piecing together things from Instagram reels and books and podcasts and webinars like this. But I think that sometimes what we need a reminder of is how connection and love with our kids is a good enough motive to grow. There's an agency in Minneapolis called Agape. And if you've ever heard of the Agape type of love, I was looking it up a little more today about how um, in ancient Greek, there are six different words for love. So you wouldn't just say like, I love Cheetos. Oh, and I love my spouse. Like there'd be different kinds of love. And so when I think about Agape love, which is, let me see my note, like selfless love, something that we can extend to all people. I read that in the last um, decade, there's been the steepest fall of empathy in the US. So in the past 40 years, it said that all nations have showed a dangerous decline in empathy levels, but especially in the US in the last decade. And I feel like sometimes because we're so busy and modern life is so full, we forget or we need the reminder that our heart that brings us to rooms like this one where we're learning about parenting, our heart is like trying to bring agape love to the surface where we are understanding where our kid is at sometimes before our own needs. We also want to be reinforced. We want to be praised. We want to be listened to. We want to be told that we're doing a good job. But since we're the grownups and the parents in this situation, I want you to know that agape love can be your primary motive for changing your behavior. You don't have to tell your parents. You don't have to tell people of other generations who don't believe you. You don't have to tell your friends how you're parenting um, when you're trying to move towards agape love. When you see something that doesn't align with your child being loved, you should say something. If your kid is in a school environment that they hate, or they're working with a professional that they feel a lot of distress over and it puts them in tears, it's okay to love them. It's okay to not force them to move into something um, that really isn't working for them. Like you are allowed to love them enough to fiercely advocate for them. And also like we're allowed to 
engage in this conversation. We're allowed to discuss things about why we parent and how we parent. And you can change your mind and you can have disagreements with me and you can have disagreements with other people or you can agree with me. But we're allowed to talk about what is meaningful when we're raising our kids. There's just so much out there with noise. Like I have this, I have a business. So like I get how much is out there on social media coming from my profiles, especially uh, included. But my question is, are you moving towards love like that, towards selfless love where you're understanding your kid before they're showing evidence that it's sinking in? And sometimes this motivator is what's going to lift you up and bring you into communities like this. And this can sometimes be a really good point for me to just remember and remind you that of what's at stake. Like what's at stake when we hear tools on how we can be better and we don't take action on them? And I'm not doing this to scare anybody, but I just think about some of my own childhood. Are you going to have more anxiety as a parent if you don't address your parenting? Are you going to be more controlling? Is your child going to be more controlling? Is there going to be more suffering and struggle or even sicknesses that evolve? I was talking to a mom today who said, you know, I think one of the reasons I'm so exhausted isn't just because of my kid and their diagnosis and their behaviors, but I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's. When we have this stress flowing through our family's lives or that fl flowed through our childhood and now we're raising our kid and we're they're now our mirror for how, how good we are at handling challenging situations or communicating them or having capacity to grow together, we can develop sickness or loneliness or even just that feeling of aloneness. So I feel really grateful that you all came here today because some of my stance is for agape love. I don't just love kids. Like I love parents and all of you professionals who are working with kids as well. So if it feels like um, you wanna stick around and you wanna learn more about the program that I'm starting in October, you're gonna be super welcome to, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna like wrap up here for everybody who's attending and doesn't wanna learn about the program and then I'll, I'll, I'll stick around later for some of your questions that I see in the chat box. So before we go into a wrap up, uh, if you would like this, um, uh, like the fire starter behaviors, you can scan this QR code. And what I'm also a believer in is that the best, like if there's something that you found today that was valuable, the best way that you can um, pay me back is to give me feedback. What did you like about this? What would you like more of? What did you not like very much so that I can improve upon it? When you scan this QR code, it's gonna ask you just five of those questions. And then at the end, it will send you the fire starter behaviors, the 11 reasons emotionally intense kids act up. If you're new to QR codes, you just point your phone over it and then you click the little link that shows up and it will let you do that. I'm also gonna stag it real quickly um, and put this in the chat box. Oh no, I'm giving you a sneak peek of my next picture. I'll get there. Come back, come back. Sometimes we can just be imperfect. I was trying to copy this for the chat box, but now I'm having a hard time doing it. All right, so if you're taking, it all takes like less than 90 seconds. So if you're taking it, great. Pardon my delay, everybody who's sticking around. Or you can just click that link, that's easy too. All right. And if you're done, you can just click type done in the chat box since I can't see you if you're taking this. I'll give it 30 more seconds. All right, thank you. So I'm going to share one more story because sometimes you see these people who are talking about parenting and you're wondering how have they ever experienced any of this despair or anything that I'm experiencing? Because we have different, um, uh, what would I say? Yeah, we all have different struggles. And so when my kid was born in August of 2020, after 30 hours of labor, which we had planned to do with the supervision of a midwife and a doula in our home environment. Um, the first cry that we heard when he was born was called a pain cry. 
I said, well, what is a pain cry? After 30 hours of labor, I was exhausted and laying on the couch. And, and what we didn't know was that when my son was born, he had broken his collarbone. And we actually didn't find out for a few months later. That's its own story that I can tell you another time. But um, Mason cried around the clock. And my husband and I looked at each other that first night with that shrieking noise that nothing seemed to help. And we're like, how do the families that we've been working with for 16 years do this? What is going on here? How are we, how are we going to navigate this? And so we ended up figuring out that there was some difficulties with latching. And so there was some soothing happening with nursing, but there wasn't a milk exchange. And so from the time my son was born on August 16th in the 86th weight percentile, over the course of two weeks, he dropped to the 10th weight percentile. And so I know there's a lot of nurses and uh, behavioral pediatricians who attend these webinars. So you know that he entered the failure to thrive status. So as a parent coach and my husband as a chiropractor, we're looking at each other and we're like, what are we going to do here? And we felt despair. I was awake at all hours. I maybe slept 90 minutes a night at a time, maybe in two segments. And I remember calling a friend of mine and she's like, you sound overwhelmed or hopeless or in despair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, Are you? She's like, um, it's something I haven't heard in your voice before. And, you know, the only two people who knew that I was in despair, my family of my four siblings didn't know, my parents didn't know, even though everybody had come to visit. The only people who knew were my parents, or excuse me, my husband, this friend and the lactation consultant. We called our fourth lactation consultant to come to our home. And the reason she needed to come see us was because I'd fallen and broken my ankle at 35 weeks pregnant. And so some of navigating this was physical trauma. I had just upgraded to crutches after being on a knee roller for the last few weeks of pregnancy. And the lactation consultant came to our house at seven o'clock AM before her own 12 hour shift with her own four special needs children at home. And she saw the crutch sitting next to my bed. And she said, I know you're in despair. And I have a lot of tools that are really effective. And I can't do this work for you. But like that crutch, I will keep coming back. And I will hold you in the space of knowledge until you feel confident enough to do this on your own. Your son will gain weight. So fast forward, very quickly, my son was able to gain weight. And this lactation consultant's name is Liz. So this was our baby when he was born. This was Liz doing some craniosacral on him early on. And this is us today, Mason and Ty and I. Mason is four years old and healthy and thriving. And I share this story because like um, I was saying earlier about my own mom's voice in my head, thankfully that's a, that's a positive voice. You can make it better. And where we get confused or where we, where we feel lost sometimes is we're trying to do it on our own and you don't have to. There's a lot of parent coaches around these days. There are a lot of people with curriculums who can guide you step by step. And if you feel like you're resonating with my approach and you would like to learn what you can do in a step by step way so that it's manageable and we're not just addressing your kid's behavior, but we're addressing you. If you want to grow to be the parent that you've always wanted to be, it's possible. So I wanted to share that to you, with you, and acknowledge that we've all been lost, we've all had doubt, we've all felt angry, uh, or we've all been angry, and there are ways that we can like pour into each other, or pour into you and my community to lift you up and give you some tools and give you some life again if your family is looking for that. For those of you who came and you only wanted education, thank you, thank you for coming. We'll send an email out shortly that has information um, about my website and the upcoming program if you'd like to read that privately. And if some of you want to stick around because you want to know about the program, um, feel free. But au revoir to those of you who are leaving and reading about this in private. You're welcome to always book a 30-minute free conversation with me through my website if you would like as well. And so for those of you who are sticking around, uh, let's talk about the nitty-gritty. So sometimes when parents come to me, you have a bunch of services on your plate already, but you don't have something that's directly um, influencing or affecting your parenting skills. So I'm going to share with you what's happening and coming up in October. You're welcome for those of you saying goodbye and thank you in the chat box. 
What happens is twice a year, I have a public offering of teaching my eight pillars of parenting that you are invited to join. The way that it works is we're starting on Wednesday, October 23rd, and you get one parenting tool a week for eight weeks. You learn that tool as a pre-recorded assignment, and then you come to our Wednesday live call if it works for you. If it doesn't, you can access the replay. But what we do is we talk about how do you customize this tool to get it to work for your family? This is a helpful program if you feel like you've read books or listened to podcasts that had good ideas, but you didn't know how to modify it for your age of child, diagnosis of child, or family circumstance. Um, and what you'll notice from this experience typically is you'll start seeing change within your first two to four weeks. And that's because we're working on a brain science level. Are you going to just practice calm? And then your kid's like, cool, thanks. I'll turn off my video game and come and eat peacefully and have a nice conversation. No, no, it's not going to work like that. But what we are going to do is we're going to start whacking the big moles first, which is practicing your own calm and shifting some of the way you're modeling regulation to your child. So their mirror neurons can pick up on it. And then we'll identify what are the top um, one or two fire starters for you to avoid because then it quickly rebuilds trust. After that, we layer in pieces like how do we spend quality time in a way that's meaningful for your kid? Because when you do that, it decreases stress chemicals and it increases dopamine and oxytocin. A good rule of thumb is if you and your kid are genuinely laughing and enjoying time together, there is less fire and more dopamine. And you might find after those situations with kids as young as 18 months, but also much, much older, you will find that um, if you've had some dopamine and happy chemicals together, it might be easy for them to do the next step. Now, if your child, like come to dinner, if your child has a hard time transitioning, we will need to customize that to make sure we have other things in place, scripts and reminders and things like that. So they know what to expect. We'll talk about how to deal with those big feelings. And then once we've built this solid relationship of calming fire and increasing bonding and trust, now you're ready for things like positive discipline, holding a firm boundary, having conversations to repair what didn't go well. And what I can tell you is that um, one of the moms I've been working with this year came to me as referred by her mental health therapy professional because she said, um, I would like to stop locking my 10-year-old boy out of the house when he's aggressive. And within four weeks, she stopped doing that. Well, we had a follow-up visit last month. She's doing a little bit of private coaching with me too. And she's like, my kid hasn't been locked out of the house for, for over an entire season now. So I'm not saying this to try to tell you something dramatic is uh, like every family is dramatic, but to say that when you calm fire and you start building trust and you have a plan that you feel confident in, and a community that supports you and believes in agape love, but also practical tools. This is a space where if you want to grow as parents, that is what I've devoted my, my life's work to. After that eight, or actually simultaneously with that eight weeks. So you're going to leave and uh, you're going to finish that eight weeks and you're going to say, uh, the things I learned in my first two classes were instrumental for changing my parenting. I'm going, I know, I know, I know. The last six weeks were just reminding you and you learning it and practicing it over and over in many situations so that it actually stuck and you made real change, long-term change. Um, one of the places where you might be surprised is that simultaneously, I offer you twice per month, Ask Samantha Calls. This is a group coaching environment where people come and they say, um, I have this kid situation and we coach for five, 10, 15 minutes. And I promise you that if there's 50 people on the call or three people on the call, you will gather something from that person sharing. And sometimes it's that feeling that you're not doing it alone. And sometimes it's that feeling like I could do this one, one better, or I might do a sneak attack with you and we'll do an exercise around why parenting in a positive way is important to you. And you're going to leave like, I'm actually doing some stuff pretty well. And now you're going to navigate the next few days knowing what you're doing well instead of feeling upset and berating yourself and staying awake at night thinking about all the things you need to do differently. So all of that is built into the community, which you get access to for six months. So that's an additional 12 group coaching calls. If this program is something that's a fit for you, typically it's $1,800. Yes, we have a payment plan. Um, for the first time in five years of offering my group program, we created a coupon of 250 bucks. 
I don't know about you, but I'm paying six bucks a carton for eggs. <laughs> oh, I'm not at the farmer's market. Come on. So um, now is the time not to raise prices for y'all, but to drop it a bit. So you can save 250 bucks. And if you decide you're not looking for that much support, but you wanted to do my online DIY program, that's usually just under 500 bucks. You can use the same coupon and apply it there at samanthamo.com slash parents. Your $250 coupon is um, active through Tuesday of next week. And so we already have a call coming up in uh, later next week. That's an Ask Samantha community call. So if you're like, I want to jump in, I don't want to wait till October 23rd. Great. Join me. Let's get started. There's a bunch of people um, from around the country that have already joined and gotten started. Okay. Specific questions I'm seeing in the chat box and privately to me. If your child has, if you have a flex spending or health savings account, yes, it covers parent coaching. So this is under the parent coaching category. You can use those funds. You usually can't use your debit card in our system. You can ask for reimbursement and just use your regular credit card. I don't know why it doesn't work in our platform. Um, if your kid has a caddy waiver, yes, that applies. If you work with a children's mental health uh, professional at the county level, counties sign up for contracts with me so that people can go through my program, yes reach out to me. Hello at Samantha Mo. I have relationships all over. Um, is there an age limit for the kids? Uh, I see Lisa asking. My sweet spot uh, is age two and a half to age 13. If they are neurotypical, if your child has autism, sensory processing disorder, um, oppositional defiant disorder, if they have uh, OCD, if they have some of these things where socially or cognitively, um, they might be 22 years old, but you're like, yeah, they're within that two and a half to 13 year age range. I'm a great match. If you exclusively have teenagers, I know nothing about kids stealing car keys and going to parties and drinking. And like, I I'm just making up generalizations here. So um, no, it's probably, it's not a good match. Please find a, a, a teenager specialist. There are some relationship tools that can benefit you, but I can't answer some of those questions. Um, but that's my sweet spot. What other questions do you have? Let me see if I missed anything. What do you got? I mean, you have if you have a family specific question, you can unmute, you can ask it for me. For those of you who are professionals, um, if you wanna get certified in teaching my eight week curriculum, like some of the mental health professionals at Frazier or the Minnesota Association for Children's Mental Health, or um, there's quite a few places throughout Minnesota, especially, then you get a free spot in this cohort. I mean, it's free, but then you pay for the certification program. We start our professional certification for people who wanna run parent groups at churches, in OT clinics, at childcare centers, if you're a mental health therapist and you wanna work with groups of parents, then you get a free spot in this and certification starts in February of next year. You should also book a call with me. So that's through my website on the professional page. And um, that way you're learning the material before you end up teaching it. If you happen to have kids at home, it gives you an internal transformation. If you don't have kids at home, it helps you space out your learning so that when we hit our 10 week phase one of certification in February, you've got a jump start, and you can start working with your clients with it now because you'll start hearing the, the language. All right, what are the questions you have? It's always a gift when I see half of the people have stuck around 15 minutes uh, after a one hour call. Do you wanna unmute? Share something that was enlightening to you or share a question. Feel free. Sure. Hi, Samantha. It's good Hi, to see Lori. You. Good to see you too. Um, my question to you is I um, am with my kids a lot at home. So when I drop them off at places like, um, you know, childcare, like Sunday at Sunday school, or like we have a co-op that we go to, sometimes it's hard for them to leave me. Mm -hmm. And part of me is like, I want to just hold them and be with them. And like, and it's hard for me too <laughs> to leave them. But um, sometimes what I do is I let them know, I give them a time and I say, okay, in the next five minutes, we can go play with this thing, but then I am going to leave. So I give them some space to just have time with me. And then I leave. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Because sometimes I'll walk out and they'll still be crying. And that just is hard for me. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to get a different answer, um, for somebody who really specializes in, um, uh, let me, let me give you this example to answer. Um, the other day, one of my friends who's a homeschooling mom and practices a parenting style called aware parenting, which means create as much space for your kids' feelings as you, as you have the capacity to do. Mm -hmm. She would answer that question in a way where she would say, give your kids the feelings and don't leave until they're ready to transition. Mm -hmm. For me, because my background is social skills and um, um, setting rules and helping kids feel comfortable with new situations that make them uncomfortable, I won't answer in that way. And I'm telling you this so that you can bounce this off of your own heart and find out what feels right to you. I think taking care of us as parents and equipping our children for a variety of environments is really useful. That's my bias. And so one of the ways from my bias that I would answer that question is um, I would ask the kids the feelings of what it does feel like when they're uh, separating, but I would do it before the separation happened. I would also, um, there's something called mind sight, which is the awareness that people are thinking different things. It's like having a bicycle wheel and many spokes on the bicycle wheel. So if everybody's only worried about the tears and the anxiety, that's one bicycle wheel that that spoke that just keeps like getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So thinking about what are some other aspects of this bicycle wheel that we can start alerting and bringing our attention to, to uh, create more holistic thinking around situations. Uh, it's kind of like if a kid missed the catch at first base, um, instead of in the car talking about how they missed the catch at first base, and you're like, but you got a really good hit. Like they don't have that flexibility to do it because they're always talking about the thing that's wrong. And if you tend to have more of a pleaser or Enneagram two personality, that's very caring. What's going to happen is this is satisfying your ego when kids rely on you for being their helper. So there is also, I'm saying this is an Enneagram two person myself. I don't know if this applies to you at all, but there is in child development, always this exploration of where am I over helping and where am I under helping? I don't hear you under helping in any way. You're a body physical support for them. You're an emotional support for them. You're tuned into their needs and you're not moving them too quickly. And one of the ways that we can, um, offer them support so that we're not over helping is helping them get used to variety if they're with safe people. So they developing safe, trusting relationships and know they can trust other people in the community, not just one person. So I guess that's kind of the philosophical answer to that question. Um, how is that landing with you? Yeah, I like that about asking like before you're frozen. Are you still there? Oh, no. Can you hear oh, me? Something just froze. I don't know if it was me. Yeah, you're frozen, but can you hear me? Is it me who froze? Yeah, oh, that was me. That was me that froze. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to not That's touch okay. anything in my room right now. <laughs> That's yeah. okay. Well, um, I like that. What are you feeling before? Like kind of talk about it. I mean, the one, the child that I have at his most is five. So I know that he's not fully there yet to express all that. Um, but I know he can share some of his emotions and think about it. And we can talk about it before. Yeah. And the other thing you can do is you don't even have to ask your five-year-old. I don't know if your child has any special needs diagnosis. You don't have mm -hmm. to say, no. Okay. Um, um, kids can start talking about this when they're three and for sure four and five. Okay. So one of the, one of my offerings to you is and you can ask about feelings. You could also just label it. Um, I don't know how you do this. If you find yourself doing this at home, but saying, I noticed that you were crying. It seemed like you were scared. Is that right? Mm. I noticed that you were holding on to my leg. It seems like you were maybe feeling worried about something. And um, how Dr. Daniel Siegel labels this is he calls it name it to tame it. So when your five-year-old feels seen, there's a good potential to create safety in the brain so that um, now he feels more resilient and equipped to transition. That's good. I noticed you were scared. And what was the rest part of that? Yeah. And, and I try to stay away from scared. I shouldn't have said that at first. I'd say something gentler, worried or nervous. Worried. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go back. Uh, we'll send this replay out. So I'll have you listen to that since there's a few other questions coming in. Okay. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah. And bye, Jay. Thank you.
All right, I see Tanya raising your hand. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Samantha. This is wonderful. Thank you. Um, a question. My almost 10 year old, um, as soon as I say, try to acknowledge the feelings, mm -hmm. he says, I'm not angry. Or, mm -hmm. So, um, do you suggest doing it in an asking way? Like, oh, you're yelling. Does that mean you're angry? Yeah, I think it, here's what I would do. I always like to look at the entry point of ease. Um, so I would look at what are the moments where your child allows you to notice their feelings? Yeah, if your kid's 10, play with asking and play with labeling and notice when your child melts and kind of sinks in, in terms of like feeling like you're really listening and they're open up to that or and notice when they're not in their resistance and they shut it down. You don't have to dig. You don't have to be their therapist. You don't have to force them to talk. Instead, I'd say notice the moments when it's probably lower intensity moments. Oh, you're stomping around. You seem upset. Oh, you toss that book hard on the table. What's up? It seems like blah, 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 blah. Do, do you hear what I'm saying there? I do. Okay, so I would go for more ease entry points. And I realized I have to leave this answer short for everybody because I just remembered I have to pick my kid up from preschool. <laughs> I'm not used to it. I'm used to working till for another 90 minutes. Um, so with that very abrupt ending, let me please offer to you, if you have a question, anybody, and you wanna set up a 30 minute free consultation call, particularly before we start on October 23rd, you can go to my website, samanthamo.com slash parents. And all of the program information is there. And there's also a link to book a free call with me, kind of close to the last fifth of the page or so. So you can find that link there. If you need it simpler, just put hello at, email hello at samanthamo.com and we'll send you the link. And then the email that will have the curriculum that we're sending out today and the replay tomorrow will also have like reply to that email, curriculum link is there, book a call with me is there, as well as remember the coupon code of um, fall 250 is what you're gonna be able to use. So um, Lisa, Thank you. I've worked with a lot of individuals with autistic young adults um, up through age 27. That's my wheelhouse. So if you feel like this is resonating with you, we should talk. You should book a call with me. Yeah, that would that would be within the wheelhouse for sure. All right. Thanks, everybody. Preschool is only four minutes away. So have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.